Hello again. Today we're going to talk about the common types of vibration sensors and some of the advantages and disadvantages to each. The sensors we're going to talk about today um, include two different types of accelerometers. Um, we'll talk about the kind, in, the kind that are used in uh, vibration measuring instruments, piezoelectric accelerometers, as well as the MEMS ones that are used in a typical smartphone or something. Um, another common vibration sensor is a strain gauge. Um, I'm assuming you've learned about this in a different instrumentation class, so we won't really go into the details, but here basically you stretch um, a resistor. The strain gauge is just a foil resistor, and when a beam flexes it stretches, and that um, changes a voltage in a circuit and, and is converted into a strain signal. Um, there are also piezoelectric strain gauges, which are basically the same idea, but use a stretching of a piezoelectric crystal to um, create the voltage rather than um, changing resistance. And so they can have much higher sensitivity, you know, maybe a thousand times higher or something. Um, so I won't say any more about those than just to mention them here, but they're also commonly used. Um, we'll talk about a laser vibrometer, and we'll end talking about digital image correlation, or using photos to measure vibration. So let's start with an accelerometer. Here's a picture of what the inside of an accelerometer might look like. And it's a little difficult to see here, but um, there's a central stud that everything is mounted to. And then attached to that is a piezoelectric crystal. And then there's a mass connected on the outside. So schematically, we can think of the accelerometer like this. We can think of it as a post, a piezoelectric crystal, and then some mass. So um, as the mass moves up and down, it shears this crystal right here, and that produces a voltage that we can then measure that's proportional to the shear, or the, the amount of displacement between the post and the mass. So we can think of this accelerometer as a mass and a spring, and we have the ability to measure the um, deflection of that spring. And the mass is on a movable base, and we're hoping to measure the motion of the base, infer the motion of the base, from the strain in that spring that we can measure. So this is probably the most common vibration instrument. If you ever go work in testing, you'll probably use these. So we'll talk a fair amount about how they work, and this will also serve to reinforce some of the vibration concepts that we've learned. So let's um, switch over here and just talk about this in a little more detail. So again, um, the schematic, just copy again here. We have a certain amount of mass suspended. We have the stiffness of the piezoelectric crystal and I'll also draw in some damping. There could be some damping in that piezoelectric crystal. And what we want to do is measure the, the motion of whatever the accelerometer is sitting on, y. And um, we can do that. We can also track the um, displacement or the difference between the motion of the mass and the motion of the base y. So if we apply Newton's laws to this, we could derive this equation, C, um, mx double dot plus cx dot plus kx is equal to cy dot plus ky. And basically that just comes from a sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. And for example, the force terms would be things like k um, k of um, y minus x, right? So that would be the um, relative displacement, you know, and that would be equal to mass times acceleration. 
or mass times x double dot. So anyway, um, we have this equation of motion, and what we're able to measure is the displacement of the piezoelectric crystal, or the displacement of the spring, x minus y. So let's call that z. Um, so if we move these two terms to the other side, we can rewrite this equation mx double dot plus cz dot plus kz is equal to zero. And we're almost to the point we could make use of this. We can measure z, but we can't measure x. So what we'll do to solve that problem is we'll subtract from both sides m y double dot. So these two terms will combine to give us um, m z double dot plus c z dot plus k z is equal to negative m y double dot. And if we divide everything by the mass, we can write this in our usual non-dimensional form. So we'll call c over m 2 zeta omega n z dot k over m is the natural frequency squared z, and that's equal to minus my, or minus y double dot. All right, so here's our equation of motion. We can use this to now try to make sense of what happens. And because in our previous lectures, we've learned that we can decompose any signal into a bunch of harmonics, let's study this in the frequency domain. So let's write y double, let's assume y double dot is some steady state motion, real part of y a e to the i omega t. And I'm using y sub a because this is acceleration amplitude, the complex amplitude of acceleration. Um, so we'll use the a, subscript a to emphasize that. And if the forcing y double dot is harmonic, then we know in steady state the response will also be harmonic. So we'll write that as real part of z e to the i omega t. And if we plug both of those in, we can solve for the complex amplitude z. On this side, we'll get a negative y a negative acceleration amplitude um, and then the denominator will have a will have minus omega squared here we have the natural frequency squared and then we'll have i omega times that middle term to zeta omega n and this is now the um, the transfer function so this tells us how the measured um, piezoelectric um, voltage. So the voltage that we measure would be proportional to the displacement across that spring. So this equation would let us convert the, um, the measured piezoelectric voltage into acceleration which is why we call this an accelerometer. It senses acceleration in the end. And this is our usual transfer function. So for example, if we were to plot the magnitude of z over y a, um, we, could, we would see the usual shape, right? The usual single degree of freedom system type shape. So one way we could use this would be to, to measure z, use an FFT, multiply that by 1 over the transfer function, um, the inverse of um, what, so he, where here we would call the transfer function um, the negative sign and all of this stuff, right? So it would kind of have the opposite shape here, right? 
could multiply by 1 over that transfer function. And then we could use an inverse FFT to get back um, YA, to get back YA of T, right? So that's one way we could do that. But um, even though that seems like a great idea, basically nobody does that. <laughs> Um, maybe not quite nobody, but practically nobody. Almost um, never is that done. Usually we want a live, kind of a real-time uh, measurement. So what's done is to exploit the fact that in this frequency range right here, there's a kind of proportionality. Or in other words, if omega is much less than the natural frequency, we can say that the voltage that's measured will be again minus YA. Um, if the natural frequency is really small, then the only then the only term that matters is the natural frequency squared, right? These terms right here will both vanish. So, um, in that case, we can say that the acceleration is simply negative omega n squared times z, right? And this is uh, precisely how accelerometers um, are designed and work. Um, so, for example, if you look up the specs, um, Well, actually, before we go there, let's just mention how, how long would this approximation be good for? Um, if we look at this transfer function right here, and um, we do some calculations, um, we could show that when omega is equal to about one-fourth, of the natural frequency, the magnitude of z would be equal to 1.066 times the magnitude of ya. Or in other words, we get a 6% amplitude error. So, um, if we keep the, fr the accelerometer frequency high relative to what we want to measure, um, we, get a, we get a tolerable amplitude error. Similarly, if we look at the phase error, the phase of z um, will be equal to um, will be equal to 178.5 degrees or we're only 1.5 degrees off of 180, which is what we're expecting with the minus sign. Um, and then we'd have plus the angle of the, acceleron of the acceleration, which is what we're actually trying to measure. So um, we get a phase error of one and a half, about one and a half degrees and an amplitude error of 6%. And um, and if you look at common accelerometers, they exactly track this. So let's go back here and let's look, for example, at PCB's 353B11. That's a really popular accelerometer and one that we use in this class. So if we look at this, it says the frequency range is up to 10 kilohertz, 10,000 hertz. And the resonant frequency will be greater than or equal to 70 kilohertz. And that gives about a 5% resolution. So they're going for a little better resolution. Here they've gone for a factor of um, a factor of seven between these two, right? Um, if you're willing to um, if you're willing to accept a little bigger amplitude error 
then we get something closer to the 0.25 factor that we talked about, right? And actually here they advertise being up, going all the way up to 3 dB, and that's about a 50% error up at 30,000 hertz here. All right, and similarly, the phase error, um, let's see, actually this part doesn't list the phase error, but the phase errors would be um, similar. All right, so that's one type of um, accelerometer. Also, I'll point out, if we looked at a different one, the 356A17, this is more similar to the ones we used in the first couple labs. These ones have a natural frequency um, greater than 14 kilohertz. And they claim that this one is good for frequencies up to 3,000 hertz. So close to that 0.25 factor again. Um, another important number to think about is this sensitivity. That's the conversion between voltage and acceleration, either in G's or here it's in uh, meters per second squared. So um, notice for this one, it's five millivolts. So every G of acceleration gives 0 0.005 volts of signal, right? This one here that has a higher natural frequency, um, this one has a sensitivity of 500 millivolts per G. Or with, for this one, one G would correspond to 0 0.5, 0 0.5 volts of signal. So um, that's important because electrical noise will eventually creep in. And maybe a good kind of starting guess is that the electrical noise will be down on the order of microvolts. Right, so the lar the smallest acceleration that we'll be able to measure um, with this sensor, you know, might be um, might be ten, say ten to the minus three g's, where this one, you know, might be able to mention or m measure down to ten to the minus five g's or something like that. And um, that, has, that also affects these low frequency numbers. Um, as frequency becomes lower, acceleration becomes lower, right? Acceleration is like a minus omega squared times um, displacement amplitude. So if this was vibration amplitude in meters, this would be the one in meters per second squared. So at low frequencies, the acceleration becomes really small. So typically, we will sacrifice our frequency resolution to get a higher um, gain, a higher sensitivity. And, um, and as we do that, we get, um, we, we get, that, we get a better signal. Um, if we need a high frequency, re or frequency bandwidth, we'll have to settle with a lower resolution. Um, but fortunately, the high frequencies that we're most interested in will um, have high accelerations and will be easier to measure. Um, let's go and just see that one more time. Let's just look at the equations one more time so we can see that for sure. Right, so again, we said here that the acceleration will be minus omega squared times z, or I guess it's easier to see in this equation, right? If the natural frequency goes up, um, z goes down, which means that the voltage goes down. So, um, so there's that trade-off that we have to deal with there. All right, so um, that's an accelerometer. I'll mention also that um, there's another type of sensor that uses the opposite limit, omega much greater than omega n. And if we look at that limit in the equation above, there we get z is now positive ya over the frequency squared. 
Right, so um, Ya was acceleration amplitude. If we converted that to displacement, so in other words, if we had our um, Y double dot, again, that was the real part of Ya e to the I omega t. If we integrated that, we could show that Y of t is the real part. Um, so if we integrate, we'll divide by I omega twice. So we'll have I omega squared e to the I omega t. And we could call this whole thing here displacement amplitude, just y. So basically this says that the displacement across the spring at low frequencies is the displacement of the base, right, at very low frequencies. And um, so, uh, so this is what we call a seismometer. And these are used to measure earthquakes and other, you know, low frequency events and things. Um, so I don't have any specs for one of those to show you, but that's the basic idea behind a seismometer. Um, all right, so that's um, how an accelerometer works, measures um, displacement. Um, by the way, the accelerometer in your smartphone, um, well, okay, anyway, let's get to that. So that's how an accelerometer works. Um, so the other type of accelerometer that you might see is that in your smartphone. And um, one thing we should mention, right, these are laboratory-grade accelerometers, very good accuracy, very good linearity, uh, great dynamic range, right, but they are fairly expensive and they need um, the electronics to drive them. Um, one of these, in contrast, you know, a three-axis accelerometer will probably be less than one dollar, maybe even on the order of cents by now. So um, these are built into your phone and they're mostly used actually to help your phone tell which way it's pointed, whether it's in portrait or landscape mode. And um, just a quick demo here. So, um, on the screen that's about to come up right here, you can see an app that's showing me the instantaneous reading from the accelerometer on my phone. So, um, there's three axes. If I move in and out, that's the blue line. If I move this way, that's the green line. And if I move what's up and down, that's the red line and the white is just the sum of all of those. So notice if I turn this 90 degrees, I get the red and green lines switching. If I turn it back, those will switch again. So by reading the steady state value of the acceleration, it's basically measuring which direction gravity is pointing, right? If I turn it this way, you can see the blue start to pick that up. So that's how your phone knows which way it's pointing. But the phone can also be quite a useful uh, vibration sensor. So, um, again, these are cheap. Um, they fit in a little tiny computer chip that can be mounted within your phone, relatively low power. These have a totally different uh, mode of operation. And um, I meant to include some slides, but basically they use um, a capacitance circuit. There's a little tiny picture here that I was going to have a blow up of for you. But uh, basically, similar to what we had before, there's a proof mass. It's got the basically a capacitor. So as this mass moves side to side in plane, for example, um, the the amount of overlap between these different fingers changes, and that changes capacitance. So there's a, there's a circuit that basically measures the capacitance 
um, and converts that to a displacement. It's more complicated than the simple proportional circuit in the lab accelerometer, but not too bad. And uh, you can get a measurement out. Because these are based on displacement, they're very good at measuring um, zero frequency signals. In contrast, these accelerometers with their piezoelectric crystals, um, the piezoelectric crystal, if you apply a strain to it, so if we look at voltage versus time, if we applied a step in the strain, we'd see the voltage leak off in a fairly short amount of time because there's some you know, resistance that allows the voltage to travel from the inside to the outside. So this limits the low frequency performance of piezoelectric accelerometers. The MEMS ones don't suffer from that. The, the capacitance here can always be measured and so um, they're good for the cell phone application there. Um, notice though um, the range on these is quite small and the, um, because of the circuit that's used to extract the displacement the frequency resolution tends to be not quite as good. Uh, there are also instrument grade MEMS accelerometers that improve on those stats but they, they do tend to have those same kind of rough characteristics you know better at you know, lower accelerations and lower um, and um, lower frequencies typically. All right, so that's a MEMS accelerometer. Uh, the other type of instrument we'll talk about is a laser vibrometer. And this uses the Doppler effect, which if you've ever stood on the road, or probably you remember this from your physics class, but if you've ever stood on the road and watched a car come by, you know that um, as the car is coming towards you, um, you, you get a change in frequency. These waves kind of hit you more quickly, so the apparent frequency goes up. And as the car was driving away, you'd see it apparently a lower frequency. The same thing works at light, even though light is moving incredibly fast compared to sound. In other words, um, if someone in the car was to shoot a laser um, into your eye or shine a light into your eye, um, as they're traveling towards you, the light would have one color and that color would change or the frequency of that light would change ever so slightly if they were moving away from you. And that's what a laser vibrometer picks up. So the way this works is we use a laser, usually a pretty high quality laser. And um, for convenience, we split the laser into two beams. One of those we send through a frequency shifter that changes the color of the light ever so slightly. And then we collect it here. The other beam goes to the part that we want to measure on you know, say this is an airplane wing that we're measuring the vibration on, and some of that light gets reflected back and also makes its way to the detector. Now, um, simplistically, you would think that we send out a beam of light, we know that it was at a certain frequency, say 430 terahertz, and we measure the frequency of the light coming in, and that would give us a measure of vibration. But we can't measure frequencies up in the terahertz range. There aren't electronic circuits that can handle that. So that's where this cell comes in, this Bragg cell comes in. It takes the frequency of the light and shifts it by, you know, some number of megahertz, maybe 20 megahertz or so, or 80 megahertz. So the frequency here coming in in this beam is F plus 20 megahertz, this one will be F plus whatever we got from the Doppler shift. And we add those together so that they interfere. So the, the F's cancel. And what we're able to measure then is the Doppler shift plus a certain um, offset. And now this is in the megahertz range where we can actually use electronics to figure out what the frequency is. Um, the next step then is going to be to use some kind of circuit that converts frequency 
right? So um, that can take, if this was the baseline frequency um, and the velocity changes, it'll get tighter and then it might get wider, right? We want to convert that frequency into a voltage that says what the frequency is versus time. So in this case, we have a high frequency that goes to like a low frequency. So that circuit is able to convert that frequency into a voltage, and that's what we measure. It sounds complicated and difficult, but it's actually the principle that your FM or frequency modulation radio uses. Um, so there are robust circuits for doing that. There are lots of different ways. The ones in vibrometers tend to be quite advanced. You might have a quite a complicated um, digital filter that's actually doing this conversion. And so it can be quite involved, the electronics that make all of that happen um, to get really low noise and, and high resolution. But in the end, what you have is, a vol is an estimate of the velocity of the surface. So this measures velocity rather than acceleration. All right, so what are the advantages of this? Um, you don't have to glue anything onto your structure. Um, it's uh, just a beam of light. Now you do need that light to reflect back, and so um, often, um, often that light will be um, um, often will put like a retroflective tape, like a shiny tape, uh, the kind of things you have on stop signs. You know that um, basically what those do are they're little beads of of glass that take the light, and rather than having the light scatter out oops. Um, rather than having this light scatter out in all directions if it hits these beads of glass then instead you get most of the light coming back the direction that came out and so you're able to collect most of the light that way so um, Oops. So sometimes, oops, sorry, sometimes that's what's needed um, um, to, to get a good enough signal. So anyway, no mechanical connection, although you might have to put some kind of retroflective tape or coating on the surface. They tend to have very high bandwidth, um, you know, up to the megahertz uh, in the previous example, maybe even up to gigahertz range. And uh, they can be very easily automated. If you just put a mirror in front of um, this laser, you can point it anywhere you want and very quickly take measurements at lots of different places. Uh, places. Disadvantages, they tend to be a little higher noise than accelerometers. And you need to be able to see the thing you're measuring. So, you know, if you want a measurement inside of a rocket um, during a test, Either you're going to need a lot of mirrors to get the laser in there, or you know you're going to have to use some other kind of sensor. Um, all right, so that's enough on vibrometers. Let's look at a case study. This is a fan for a commercial air conditioning unit. So these blades spin, um, and we'll, we'll hold the fan just parked, and we'll use the laser um, to measure the vibration. So um, here's a little better picture of the fan so you can see what these blades look like. And we're interested in the vibration modes of these blades because that will control how quickly the fan can turn and uh, without hitting resonance and causing damage, either noise or damage to the blades or the housing. So um, what we did, you can't really see it back here, but we um, attached a shaker so that we could continuously drive vibration into the fan. And then we used a, a laser vibrometer to set up a grid of points on the fan blades and to measure the motion. And um, so these measurements can be pretty um, time consuming. Um, here's a picture of the shaker, how we had to set that up. The reason we need that is because, um, you know, if we're going to measure at a grid of 100 points, we'll be doing 100 different measurements. And so to do something handheld would not be very repeatable or very convenient. Um, 
so with a laser vibrometer, you know, there's um, some time for setting up the shaker. There's some time for acquiring um, the measurements. And um, and we're fairly, you know, in a, in a matter of time, a certain amount of time, we're able to collect mode shapes that look like this. So we can identify the modes. So um, these animations will show you this a little more clearly. Oops, sorry, need to get this back off of the pointer. Okay, so um, here's the first mode vibration. It's basically rocking of the fan back and forth. So we get one blade going up, the other's going down. You can kind of see that. Um, this mode is actually a torsion of the blades. And notice there's also a phase relationship. These two are going, um, these two, these two go down and up at the same time while this one moves in opposition. And if you go to even higher frequency, this is at 85 hertz, you actually get to the point that you see bending of the blades. Um, so here's a mode where we get the blades kind of bending along their wide direction. So um, it would take a lot of accelerometers or a lot of um, um, measurement points, impact points with a hammer if we did it the way we do things in class to get this level of resolution. So the laser vibrometer is really revolutionary in that regard. It's allowed us to measure usually with much higher spatial resolution than we could measure otherwise. Um, so a very strong advantage um, of it. Um, and we can really see how a structure is moving and really um, and use that information. Okay, so um, I should mention though, to get these measurements, um, to get actually a complete measurement, like if we were doing a, si a sweep uh, in sign or random input or something like that, we'd be talking about several minutes of data at each point. And it could take hours and hours and hours to collect data everywhere on the fan like this. So, um, but with um, what was actually done here was to take one measurement at a small number of points, figure out where the modes were, and then we drove it at steady state at each of these frequencies. And then the laser could just spend a fraction of a second at each point, figuring out what the amplitude and phase of the vibration was at that point. Knowing the frequency, that can be done very quickly and uh, with, with, that, with less noise. And so that's how these were actually acquired. Okay, so that's your conventional um, laser vibrometer. Um, imagine though we wanted to use that on a wind turbine. So um, here, um, you know, a wind turbine is a huge, tall structure. The nice thing about the vibrometer is that we could sit the vibrometer on the ground somewhere, shine it up there, not have to connect anything. What's typically done, by the way, with wind turbines is to send climbers up to attach accelerometers, um, glue them on, connect them to a wireless data acquisition system, or wire all the way down into the hub and through slip rings into the body. Um, and then transmit the data off and take uh, you know then start you can start the turbine up uh, up again once the climbers are off so pretty expensive to set up and um, and um, time consuming to set up so um, so you could use a vibrometer you could shine it on the laser from any point and actually do this problem is you you know one laser gives you a measurement at one point right and um, if, if we only, you know, having the measurement at only one point, um, um, at only one point doesn't give us that much information. Now we could use a whole array of laser vibrometers, but these tend to be tens of thousands, you know, typically $50,000 per laser. So to connect a lot of them in parallel is a lot more expensive than to connect a lot of accelerometers in parallel. So people don't usually do that. 
So one idea that was proposed not too long ago was to actually sweep the laser. So put a mirror in front of the laser and send a sinusoidal signal to the mirror so that the mirror is sweeping back and forth along the length of the surface that you're trying to measure. And then there are some algorithms that were, um, that were derived for um, figuring out what the, vi what the modes of vibration are from this signal where position is changing with time and vibration is also a function of time. So our group here at the University of Wisconsin also developed some methods along these lines. I can show you a picture of what this looks like. Um, right here. Just take one second to download. Well, let's see, one minute to download. I can show you that in a minute. Um, basically what we've done is we've made a laser show u useful, right? We send a laser sweeping across a surface to paint it with light. We take measurements as a function of time and um, convert those into a uh, vibration signal. Um, I'll show you one other, I can show you another, I can show you a picture of what that looks like in a minute. So um, I'll show you an application we did. This isn't quite the industrial scale uh, turbine that I just showed. This is a smaller scale wind turbine with only about a 30 meter tower height, 10 meter diameter. And um, we tested this concept out using a, using a laser on the turbine um, when the blade is in a parked condition. So we had the brakes on, the blade parked. Theoretically, you could, tr you could tune the laser to scan and follow a blade as it's vibrating, but that, um, that requires some extra work that we didn't go through in this case. So um, we did actually coat the blade with tape, reflect reflective tape, so that we could get a lot of light back. And um, we let the blade vibrate uh, due to the ambient wind. So this is an operational version of continuous scan vibrometry, which is something that we developed. And to kind of show you just roughly how that works, if you just put the laser on the tip of the blade and measured the power spectrum or auto spectrum, um, after averaging for a little while, you would see um, several peaks in the measurement. And so you would know roughly what the different natural frequencies of the turbine are. You just wouldn't know what mode shapes each of these correspond to. So in contrast, if we use a continuous scan, so we scan the laser continuously, um, and here we scanned at one hertz, so you know, every one point, or every one over 1 1.6 seconds, the laser would sweep back and forth. We get a more complicated spectrum, but we're able to derive an algorithm that converts, um, converts that spectrum into a mode shape. So let's um, see a demo of what this actually looks like. All right, so this is um, on a, a ski, which is kind of like a beam. There's the laser vibrometer. The, there are mirrors inside there that direct it. Um, so if we wanted to measure the vibration modes of this ski, we could sweep the laser back and forth you were seeing maybe something like one hertz initially, but we're sweeping that up to more like 50 hertz or something like that. Uh, actually, the speed is so fast that the camera can't quite keep up, so it seems to be um, choppy. It aliases due to the finite rate of the video. Theoretically, though, one impact with a hammer and as the response decays, you could measure the mode shape all along this line from that one measurement. We could repeat it at a few different lines and stitch together everything that happens on the ski. And we don't have to scan just in lines. You could imagine all kinds of different patterns that you could paint on a ski and measure the mode shape at all of, those, at all of the points along that line, along that pattern. So, um, so that's what's being illustrated there. So again, it's like a laser show, right? You could paint Mickey Mouse's face and you could measure the mode shape all along his uh, face if you could do that with the mirrors that you're, that you're scanning with in theory. 
All right, so that's um, continuous scan vibrometry. In this case, on the turbine, we're just scanning on a line at a relatively low frequency for reasons that I won't go into right now. Um, and from that, uh, this is position along the blade. This is um, vibration and amplitude. And so this, this is the root or the hub here, and this is the tip of the blade. So um, this tells us right here that this first one is the vibration of the blade, um, the, or the rigid body motion of the blade. So if I'm the wind turbine, this is the mode where the whole tower moves back and forth like this, and the blade is just deforming rigidly. Now, in contrast, this second mode right here, here the root of the blade is sitting still and the tip is moving. Right? So this would be a mode um, where the blade is vibrating like this. Right? And this last one is a mode where we have the middle of the blade going backwards and the tip going forward, right? So we have something like that, right? Um, the elbow can only do it one direction, but in reality it would need to flex both ways, right? You'd get motion, like in the first mode, you get mo or second mode, you get motion like this. But in any event, um, those are the different modes. There's multiple copies of each. There are three blades. And so you actually get three copies of this first bending mode, where the three blades have different phasing. You know, they might go all together. We might get two blades going forward, one blade going back, kind of like you saw in that air conditioning fan. Um, but anyway, from this measurement, we're able to work out what all of those mode shapes are and now explain what's happening in this spectrum. Why, what, what all those different frequencies are. So it's pretty powerful. Um, we also did this with a new, um, a new laser. This is one that Polytech developed for long range testing. And so this laser didn't actually need to coat the, we didn't need to coat anything with retroflective tape. Um, we could just um, drive up and set up the laser and use it. So we, we shined this laser on a set of mirrors so that we could scan the laser back and forth. And um, this video gives you an idea of what that looks like. So this is looking through the lens of the laser. And you can see the laser then scanning its measurement point back and forth along the surface of the blade. All right, so um, so that's that measurement. So um, using that laser, we did two things. We used uh, we left a, our our red laser at the tip, and we took four measurements um, with the laser with this roving RSV laser at a fixed point, and we could get these mode shapes out of that measurement. Um, they're a little choppier than the ones you saw before, right? Um, a little more difficult to um, pull out accurate mode shapes. And at each one of these points, we needed five minutes even just to get a good enough measurement that we could pull out these modes. So something like 25 minutes just to take this data. Right? In contrast, um, only six or seven minutes to scan and back out the mode shapes with um, with this type of resolution, as you saw here. So to put that into perspective, right, 25 minutes, that's, that's almost as long as you've been listening to this lecture, right? So you get pretty bored just sitting there for 25 minutes waiting for your system to take data. Seven minutes is much better. So, um, um, so this basically uh, just compares the, um, the different approaches, the advantage. With the continuous scan, we could speed up the test a lot. And, um, and that's really convenient. It saves time and saves money. Um, as Again, to put that into perspective, if we can cut the test down from 10 minutes rather than maybe an hour that you might spend watching this lecture, we can save a lot of time. This picture, by the way, shows what I did while I was waiting for each of those five or 10 or 20 minute measurements to get done, right? Just enjoying some pizza. 
Anyway, um, that wraps up this module. We'll talk now about one last measurement technique, and this is digital image correlation. And basically, we use two cameras. In 3D, we use two cameras. In 2D, we could use one. We use um, two cameras to take some photos of a part, and we compare the two photos to work out the displacement of every point on the structure. So you can actually, you can measure the shape of a part, you can also, you can measure low frequency, and if you have fast enough sample rates on the cameras and enough light, you can actually work out motion at many, many points simultaneously. So to do this, though, you do need a pattern. You need some kind of rough, um, speckly pattern on the surface so that you can, uh, so the cameras can easily tell one point from the next and you collect videos um, and if you're collecting um, you know at thousands of samples or frames per second you can easily fill, get tens or hundreds of gigabytes in just a few minutes so for example doing a test like this at the Air Force we had 64 um, gigs on, on the two cameras um, that we could capture 64 gigs of memory at the sample rates and the resolutions we were doing, we would fill the, that memory in somewhere around 30 seconds. And then we would have to stop because it takes about, you know, 15 minutes to offload 64 gigs of data, even over a really fast Ethernet cable onto a computer. Right. So the amount of data that you can collect here is just huge. Um, and again, the way this works is we take images from the two cameras, deformed and undeformed. We identify, the, the software identifies a region, a, um, a region of pixels, and it figures out how do I have to transform this set of pixels to match this one. And you, doing that, it works out the displacement in three dimensions of that cluster of pixels. And doing, and doing this on two camera, or on one camera, you could easily get the two-dimensional motion. And if you combine two cameras, you can get the out-of-plane as well. So um, uh, some challenges in doing this. Um, it, you need to go through a fairly difficult calibration process because cameras don't um, return perfect images. Cameras have round lenses. The images that come back will be rounded near the edges. And so you typically have to go through a detailed calibration to account for all of that. Um, you have to become a photographer because the quality of your data depends on the lighting, the depth of field, shutter speed. Um, so if you've had a photography class, you know what those terms are. If you've never used anything but an iPhone, you might have no idea what I'm talking about. But all of those things become important to getting high quality measurements with DIC. Um, so I'll just show you some examples of some potential error sources that you get here. One is lighting. Um, initially when these came out we'd use overhead or fluorescent lights and you'd see um, signals um, in the image intensity at 120 Hertz. That's the typical uh, flashing frequency of a fluorescent light. Even an incandescent maybe you can have a um, a little bit of a component of that. Um, fortunately, LED lamps have been developed that don't have that problem, or at least not in the frequency ranges we care about. And they also can actually output a ton of light without outputting a lot of heat. So that's really been a big game changer in DIC systems. Um, if you don't use LEDs, then you tend to get frequencies appearing in your vibration measurements at the light frequencies. Um, you know, another thing that's been investigated are vibration of the camera. You know, fan, um, the camera fan turning on and off. Um, newer systems are set to keep the fan off during a measurement. Um, but if the mounting for the camera um, has a vibration mode, that can show up in your measurement. But the biggest thing, and one of the most important and most challenging things to learn with DIC, is the speckle pattern. 
Um, you know, the resolution of the speckle pattern that you use will determine the measurement resolution. Um, so that you need a speckle pattern that's commensurate with the pixel resolution that you have. And, the, um, and all of that has to relate to the amount of vibration that you will get. Typically in an image, right, if it doesn't move so that you can see it, you won't measure anything. With really high quality correlation software, you can measure down to a fraction of a pixel, say maybe a tenth of a pixel. So if this block moves over one tenth of a pixel, we should be able to detect that in the software. So I'll need to zoom in such that the motion that I want to measure is, you know, larger than a tenth of a pixel, but not so large that this point goes in and out of focus. So, um, um, so one thing that's nice though that can be done is if you do a, a histograms on the different speckle patterns on, on you can um, use that to get a measure of what the quality of the speckle pattern is for a certain purpose. So that's kind of what these are showing. Um, if the speckle pattern is not regular enough, you can get banding when you do a 2D Fourier transform of it. So um, it's important to have more random speckle patterns such as these. These were done by tapping a marker on the surface, where these ones were you know, generated with certain correlations in them. Uh, and that will distort the measurement. So anyway, doing all of this, um, oops, um, you can eventually get a measurement of all of the points that are visible. So if we go back to our setup picture here, um, here we're measuring the vibration on a curved beam, large amplitude vibration, so there's nonlinear dynamics going on. And so the DIC is able to measure all along the length of the beam and, and, uh, and through the thickness, through the width of the beam, sorry. Um, and all of that, um, if we take a measurement where we sweep the excitation frequency and do a Fourier transform, in one measurement, you know, that 64 gigs of data can tell us a lot. It can show us, you know, the deformation shape at low frequency. As we go to higher and higher frequency, we can see how that deformation shape evolves. Notice out here, you know, we have six humps per the length of the beam, so we're up to a higher order bending modes of the beam. And all of that can be captured in one measurement. So, um, you know, it does tend to be maybe a little noisy because, um, you know, we're, we're extracting relatively small displacements from video images, but we get a lot of data for very cheap, uh, relatively speaking. So we can maybe afford to, you know, um, average over, average spatially or take that data and smooth it out and figure out what's happening. So very powerful technique for vibration measurement. Powerful technique for various things, crash and large amplitude motions, and it's starting to be useful for vibration measurements as well. All right, so that concludes everything we'll cover today on vibration sensors. We will see you next time.